Hi, Mike Byrne here for The Curious Photographer. You know, I've always been a curious sort of person. I, I like to figure out how things work. I like to explore. And, uh, you know, when I first got my hands on a camera, I saw all the wonderful pictures some of the great photographers were making, and I, I really always kept thinking, how do they do this? Where did they have to go? What did they have to do to get these pictures? And I started playing. I, you know, I, I didn't have a whole lot of formal education, but I loved getting out there and picking up a new lens, a macro lens, for example, and seeing if you couldn't get some of these amazing shots. Uh, or working with still life, or shooting wildlife images. You know, wildlife really attracted me because it seems so cool, these amazing African animals or South American animals or even you know, bears and some of the incredible pictures and I wanted to get those pictures too. And then sports. I've always been a bit of a sports nut so I wanted to play in sports and, and try to get the kind of dramatic goal-winning pictures and things like that. And you know, Curiosity is a great thing in photography because there are so many ways you can play with a camera to try to express yourself, to, to try to take the images from your head and get them out onto paper. And, uh, and really that's why I thought of this show as The Curious Photographer, because it's really all about exploring the limits of what you can do with a camera, from basic capturing some really nice landscapes to taking an image and manipulating it with a computer or maybe combining multiple images to again come up with a final result that matches what you saw in your head at the first point. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about light. Light to me is the most important aspect of photography, pretty much any type of photography. You really need great light to make great images. You know, a good friend of mine, uh, a really good wildlife photographer, told me his sort of philosophy on, on looking at photographs. He said, you know, there's three things that really matter in a photograph. Subject matter, composition, and light. And he said, you know, if you get one of the three right, I call that a groaner. If you get two out of three right, I call that a grinner. But if you get all three right, that's a screamer. And if you get all three right, you usually have a really great image. And I thought about that and I thought, well, subject matter is probably the easiest to deal with. You try to find something interesting uh, and photograph it. And if you find that subject, whatever it is, interesting, then you have well, a good subject. Composition uh, is definitely challenging and, and there's a real art to good composition. But to me, light is the hardest of the three. It's so important to get light right. And if you don't get it right, you probably won't have a great image. And in many cases, you can't really control light. If you're shooting outdoors, you're, you're, you're really at uh, the whim of the sun, what the sun is doing for you or the shadows is doing for you. They will make or break your image. If you're indoors, you can work with natural light or available light or ambient light, or you can start adding light by working with flashes or, or just by flashlights, just about any light source will do. But indoors, you need to work with light sources to produce the best images possible. Working with light outdoors is really a question of patience, planning, and preparation. For example, look at this image that I captured at the Kukanoff Gardens in the Netherlands. You know, I love this subject matter, this kind of stream of purple flowers uh, with the trees around it. It makes it for a great subject matter. So I had one of my three. Composition, well I like this composition. It too uh, reflects the image that I was seeing in my head. So I've got two out of three. But if you look at the light in the image, it's not doing me any big favors. It's not terrible, but it's also not great. So I, I captured this image and I thought, okay, what do I need to get great light? And essentially it comes down to looking at the sun, looking at your watch and saying, when do I need to be here? If I like this composition, what's going to be the best time to be here and the best kind of light? Do I want a little bit of cloud? Do I want full sunlight? And what time of day is that going to give it? Am I going to be able to get that? So I came back to this a little earlier the next day when I had some nice sunshine filtering through the trees and now look at the difference. It's almost the same composition, certainly the same subject matter, but you can see really clearly the difference that a little bit of light makes. Sometimes when you're outdoors, you can't just say, well, the subject matter's here, work out the time, 
the place to be there because your subject matter is moving, working with wildlife, for example. So the trick to getting great wildlife images is, well, first of all, luck. It takes a lot of good luck to get great light. Or second of all, patience. You know, most really spectacular wildlife images are captured by photographers that came back to a location or came back to a subject time after time after time until everything was just right. Which is why if you're on a photo safari, say to Africa, you do have to rely a lot more on luck because you simply can't spend months at a location hoping that all the circumstances get right. But when they do, being able to work with your driver is absolutely critical. So looking at this image, these are three lions up in a tree. I mean, it's rare enough that you get three lion cubs in a tree, let alone in nice afternoon light. But in this case, I was super lucky because here we have it, a little rainbow cutting in right behind the lions. As soon as I saw this image, I grabbed my driver and said, hey, we need to get to this location. And literally, we tried to inch ourselves to get a little higher, a little to the left, a little to the right until I had the rainbow exactly where I wanted it. And you know, also, you have to be able to do this quickly. So I didn't have time to waste because I can't, you know, can't count on the rainbow hanging around for more than a few minutes. So working outdoors, working with a driver who knows uh, to work with you, and you have to know, too, where you want to be. So I saw the lions in the tree. I knew I needed to get the light more or less behind me. I wanted to, to center the rainbow so that it was easily visible but not blocking by the, or blocked by the lions. Those are all really important things to do outdoors. And you need to be prepared. You know, given how much time I was spending literally just trying to get myself in the right position, I didn't have time to fiddle with my camera. I needed to know that I had the right settings. So a lot of that is preparation. When I'm working outdoors, I usually have my camera set up beforehand using custom uh, functions like C1, C2, C3 that a lot of cameras have these days so that I can set custom function one to be my slow moving animal default settings. If I do that, then I can literally move one click, pick up my camera, and I know that my settings are more or less right for that image. I don't have to worry about checking my aperture, checking my shutter speed, changing my uh, ISO, and I don't have to worry about knowing if I'm in single shot or multiple shot. Those things are all pre-programmed into my custom setting. And in this case, with these lions, that was really important because we got ourselves in position, I clicked off a, a few shots, and then literally the rainbow went, a couple of the cubs jumped down the tree, and the shot was done. So I was very lucky, but I was also very prepared and I had a good working relationship with my driver so that he understood what I was looking for and together we worked together and I managed to get a really nice shot and again good subject matter I like the composition but it's the light that makes this image what it is. Again working outdoors there are some times of the day that are much better to shoot at than others. Generally speaking the best times to shoot are going to be first thing in the morning or last thing in the evening, uh, just before dusk or dark. Although sometimes in the evening you can extend into sort of the blue hour after the sun has gone down. So this next image was shot at sunrise or just before sunrise. This image again was a lot about planning and preparation. We went out the day before looking for good subject matter for a nice photogenic tree. Then we used a compass to figure out where the sun would come up so that we could work out a good position to be in, getting the sun to rise up behind the tree. So realistically, we had this all planned out, knowing what time sunrise would be. So the next day we get up, five o'clock in the morning, get in our truck, drive to the location, and we're ready to go. Tripods on the ground, camera out, and then it's just a question of waiting for the sun and shooting all the different images we were able to get. This was my favorite, the sun hasn't quite come up, but we shot images here for probably close to an hour as the sun came up. We were able to shoot it coming over the branches of the tree. And you know, again, this is taking advantage of the nice morning light. A few hours later, it's not the same picture at all. In fact, it just looks like a tree in a field. So morning light is really important for sunrises and you can get some gorgeous images this way. The other time of the day worth shooting, is you know, the late afternoon and the early evening. If you look at wildlife images, most of them are shot are either morning or, or, or late, day, in, late in the day. Most wildlife 
isn't active, especially in, in hotter climates during the day. It's hot, they're tired, they find shade to sleep in, and you know, you can take a million pictures of sleeping lions, but yeah, after 10, they all pretty much look the same. So lions, for example, they come to life, generally speaking, late in the afternoon and they hunt in the evenings. So that's when you need to photograph them if you want to get them doing anything dramatic. See, another good thing about shooting in the late afternoon and the early evening is if you can find a water hole, animals will start coming to the water hole usually late in the afternoon or early in the evening and it makes a spectacular location because the action will come to you. And if you're lucky and the sun does you some favors and the sky does you some favors, you might get some nice sunset colors, pinks and oranges and position yourself right. You can reflect those in the water so you can get animals in good light, you can get reflections. And this one image, I, I was just spectacularly lucky. The sky lit up with oranges and yellows and pinks and blues and these giraffes came down to the water hole and although you know, I chose to expose the image for the sky you, so you don't really see the giraffes, but you do see their silhouettes reflected in the water and to me this was just a really cool image and when you find light like this you just have to take advantage. This is light to die for. This is how you get those images that my friend would call a screamer. So the previous image was a planned shot that we had thought through entirely. But of course sometimes you just get really lucky. And one day uh, I was camping out on a place called Spring Island, uh, up in a place called Cayucid on the west coast of Vancouver Island. My tent was just off the beach and well, being a photographer I tend to wake up early but this morning I was comfortable in my bed and I just happened to notice, I think I was still asleep, but somehow my brain triggered that there was some interesting light coming through the, uh, the windows in the tent. And I, I looked up and I'm like, holy crow, look at that. Uh, and I literally, I just grabbed my camera, stepped outside the tent, five steps onto the beach, and clicked this image. And you can see the light was amazing. And again, this is a great example of morning light, take advantage of light when you can get it, because this is what makes a picture. But the funny thing about this story is, yeah, the light was gone in, in maybe two minutes. So I was lucky to capture this and I put my camera away. I walked uh, down the beach to where a bunch of us were having breakfast and the lady who was cooking breakfast said, Mike, Mike, you got to see this picture I got this morning. And she held up her iPhone and she had this spectacular picture. Same light that I had, but she had a much nicer setting. And I looked at that and said, wow, you know, it doesn't matter what camera you have. She was in a better place with the same light and her picture was definitely a screamer. I looked at mine and said, my subject matter was pretty good, my composition was pretty good, my light was pretty good, but she beat me because her subject matter was just better. And so sometimes luck is huge and being in the right place at the right time is, uh, can be planned, but sometimes it just happens and, and you just need to be ready to take advantage of it. So in the late afternoon, it's great for wildlife pictures out on the plains, but don't put your camera away as it starts to get dark. Watching the sun go down can produce some spectacular images as well. And it's kind of many ways of working with it. If you have the light behind you, it'll give you some beautiful lit up animals. But also I love to play with silhouettes. This one image, we were shooting uh, in the south coast of France where we had some wild white horses running through the water and so on. Uh, and the, these horses are run by a group of people called the Guardians. And while I was focusing on the horses, the wild horses, just out of the corner of my eye, I noticed one of the guardians up and realized the sun was setting just perfectly behind her. So I switched my focus entirely, moved myself a little bit so I could silhouette her. And again, this is just one of those sort of opportunistic images that produced, well, to me, it's, it's, it's a shot that was made entirely by the light. She is silhouetted, it becomes sort of iconic. And you need to look for those opportunities in the evening. Uh, and then once the sun has gone down, the blue light that comes up on a clear sky evening or maybe with a little ripple clouds can be spectacular to work with, particularly in urban settings. In the city of Bruges in Belgium, it's, it's, it's absolutely to die for location for urban photography because these beautiful old buildings that are lit up and they're surrounded by canals. So you have opportunities for reflections, old buildings, blue skies, like deep blue skies maybe 45 minutes after sunset. And again, it makes for spectacular images. It's 
all about timing and being in the right place. And you know, one little tip that's worth uh, noting, sometimes you'll be out there and there's just a little bit of wind so you don't have uh, great reflections in the water because there's too much rippling. You can fix that by simply exposing the image a lot longer than you might otherwise. So like a 45 second exposure will ultimately flatten out the water and you can get your reflection back. Aside from time of day, the season is also important to think about when you're planning your photography. Spring and fall are great times to take pictures early in the morning, into the you know, mid-morning, and starting again at say three or four in the afternoon and working all the way through to sunset. Summer's more challenging. For starters, the good light is often, especially in this part of the world, at six o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning. Uh, and it seems to disappear quicker than it does in spring and fall. Likewise, uh, towards the end of the day, in the summer, it seems like you wait forever for the sun to go down uh, and the light to get good, and then bing, half an hour later, it's gone. So spring and fall, great times for photography. And then there's winter. In this part of the world, winter is actually a great time to take pictures. The sun never gets directly overhead, so the shadows are never a real problem. And I love taking pictures in the winter because realistically, you get sunrise, is it a decent hour? Uh, and then the light stays good pretty much all day long and you have lots of time in the evening or the late afternoon to capture the pictures as the sun goes down. So I love taking pictures in the winter. This one image I took out when I was cross-country skiing and uh, it's probably right about midday as uh, we were crossing a pass uh, going into Skokie Lodge uh, near Lake Louise. And the light isn't harsh, it has kind of a side-lit appearance uh, even though it's right at midday, so you can do a lot of playing in wintertime in Canada and produce some really nice images. So here's another winter image. This time I was cross-country skiing at Sun Peaks and I'd gone up uh, a couple hills and, uh, and basically skirted a mountain. And on my way back into the, the village, you know, I just had this wonderful little trail disappearing off into the distance and the sun setting off to the one side. And I think this picture is probably about three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and to me, the light is, is wonderful. So winter is a great time to take pictures. If you think about this same image when you're hiking in the summer, the light's going to be terrible at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, seasons are important. Plan your trips. And uh, if you're really keen on photography, plan your trips for when the time uh, or when the light is going to be best. Another little tip, if you, for example, waterfalls. We love taking pictures of waterfalls, but you need to think about which way does the waterfall face. If the waterfall faces to the east, then you need to make sure the sun is in the west lighting up the waterfall. So again, pull, bring your compasses, bring your watches, know what time sunrise and sunset is, and that will produce far and away the best light for your landscape and your wildlife images. So far, we've talked mostly about photographing outdoors. But what happens if we move indoors? Indoors is awesome for light because now you can control it 100%. You can turn lights on, off, you can move lights, you can use speed lights, you can use things like gobos and scrims. A gobo is something that goes between the light and the subject matter, and you usually use it to diffuse the light, make it a little bit softer. So I love working indoors because now I can add light, subtract light, and put it exactly where I want it. If you look at this one image, you can see the model is clearly lit directly at her face, and I've put my camera over this side. It's just one light, I've scrimmed it down so that it only lights up a certain part of her, but it gives exactly the impact I wanted. Now, if you look at this second image, I actually have two here. You can see how I've really controlled the light. In the first case, I took a piece of black cloth and I cut kind of a lightning bolt shape in it. And then I put that between my flashlight or my speed light and the subject so that it gave kind of a lightning bolt like look on her face. And again, after this, it was just a matter of positioning the model, positioning my camera to get the exact look that I wanted. In the second image of the same model, I've used more lights now. I've lit up her from the side, from the back, and I've created another strong light to produce a shadow on the concrete wall. It's all about using these lights to 
get a sort of mood or to capture a feeling. Uh, and in this case, I wanted it to be quite stark and harsh. So I have a concrete background. The shadow is a little bit harsh. The light is a little bit harsh. But it gave me the feeling that I had in my head when I saw the model and thought about what I was trying to capture. In many ways, I think of myself as a portrait photographer. Uh, I love to take portraits of people, but I also think of myself as a portrait photographer in terms of landscapes and wildlife and even sports. So when I see a landscape that just really captures me, I feel like I'm capturing a portrait of that landscape. Likewise, when I'm working with athletes, sometimes it is about capturing the action. But in most cases, I think I'm capturing an athletic portrait, something that shows the grit, the determination, the sadness of losing, the exhilaration of winning. That's a portrait more than it is an action shot. And that's what I look for in sports photography. A lot of people ask me about using lights outdoors, particularly with wildlife. And I want to say right up front that I'm not a fan of using speed lights with wildlife. I think the power of a speed light is too great and has the potential to both distract the animals and it may actually damage their night vision and some people have said it might even damage their vision. I don't know if that's true, but I don't want to take the chance. I think using bright lights on animals is just unethical uh, and not likely to produce great pictures. However, there are times where using lights outdoors can be really useful. Take a look at this image. This is just after sunset in Namibia. Uh, we had stopped for what they call a sundowner, which is to say a beer or a nice drink while we watched the sun go down. Uh, and people had loaded up in the truck and the driver flipped the headlights on and I looked at this and thought, whoa, hold on, there's a photograph. We had the foreground lit by the Jeep's headlights, we had the people in the truck lit by the truck lights, the sky was still nicely lit, uh, we had Venus and Mars. and So I jumped out, grabbed my camera and a tripod, and captured this image. But there was one problem. There's a kind of black blob underneath the people in the truck. And uh, it just didn't quite work. And I thought, hold on. I grabbed a flashlight and I recaptured the image. But this time, with an exposure of about 15 seconds, I used the flash just to light up the side of the truck. To me, that gave the picture a little better context and way better balance. Going home that night, then we just by coincidence happened upon a female lion. She was lying just maybe 10 meters off the side of the road. And our driver had a big LED style spotlight. And when he flashed it upon her, she was just looking at us kind of curious. That kind of light I don't think impacts the animal. It's not super bright and it's not like a flash which is an instant output of a massive amount of light. And she wasn't disturbed at all. She just stared at us. And once again, I grabbed my camera and thought, cool, because everything else was black. All you really saw was the lioness uh, and most of her body. I thought the image worked really well. But again, there was one trick to that. The light on her is really bright in comparison to the pitch black night. So when you're using your camera, it's probably going to mess up the exposure on this picture if you're not careful. Because it sees so much black, it's going to overexpose everything that matters, the lion. So what I did is I just set my exposure compensation to minus two, and now I got an exposure that worked just fine. So here's another example of using lights on wildlife. Again, this animal is lit specifically with just a little LED light. It's not a lot of light, which means from a photography point of view, you need to keep your shutter speeds low and you have to have your ISO high. I shot these images with ISOs as high as 25,600. That's how little light there was. So the light didn't bother the animal, but it did make for some really nice shots. Uh, and eye eyes, you know, there's no other way to get this image. They are nocturnal animals. You, I've, I've ne personally, I've never seen one during the day, and I don't think any, any of my drivers have ever seen them or my guides have ever seen them during the day. So you go out looking for them at night, put a little LED light on it, and have your camera set up, be prepared. Know that you'll be at high ISOs. Know that your shutter speeds won't be as high as you like them. So if it runs, if it jumps, it's gonna be really hard to get a sharp image. But here, where it poses with this coconut, 
I can afford to shoot at a, a shutter speed of a two hundredth of a second or even a hundredth of a second and still get a nice sharp image. And by the way, IIs got to be one of the coolest and weirdest animals I have ever seen. If you look carefully, they have these claws and they're extended almost a couple of inches and they use them so they can dig into the coconuts and they literally tear the husks to shreds. So amateur sports can be difficult to shoot because the light isn't good and you know you just have to do what you can and work with what you've got. Happily as you move up to professional sports lighting becomes much easier. Almost all professional sports are lit for TV cameras and that means there's enough light for you as a still photographer. Now it comes down to planning and preparation. Think about the sport, understand the sport and know where the action is most likely to happen. Then get yourself in the right position so you can capture it as dramatically as you see possible. Uh, in this picture with the wheelchair athletes, I wanted to be low because I really wanted to make sure they looked powerful and I wanted to capture them coming around this corner because I knew I would get a little bit more depth of field to the shot. So out here, I'm actually probably lying on my belly trying to make sure I have at least a little bit of angle just to capture them as they come around the corner and I don't have to worry about light. The TV lights gave me enough to capture this exposure at a fast enough shutter speed that the athletes aren't blurred. Now when you move up even further, say to the Olympics, lighting is an issue again. There's lots of TV camera light but the Olympics specifically do not allow you to use flash of any sort. So there is a bit of a challenge but there's also a real big bonus. The Olympics spend a lot of time and effort to make sure that backdrops are clean and that lighting captures where the action is most likely to happen. So the Olympics you can position yourself exactly where you want to be and now you get to look at not only where the action is going to happen but what the background is going to be. At the London Olympics for the horse jumping they had the downtown core in the background which could make beautiful pictures if you composed it properly. Um, at most of the indoor events you would see nice bright colors and Olympic logos where you wanted them and that is all very carefully done so you as a photographer just have to take the time to take advantage of all of that. Use the lights they've given you, use the clean backdrops, understand your sport so that you're in the right place at the right time and just remember always great light makes for great pictures.